Good morning, Year 9. Um, welcome to lesson number two of week seven, uh, where we are continuing on with our journey of transpiration in plants. So today we're going to be looking at factors that affect the rate of transpiration in plants. Hopefully you remember what transpiration is from yesterday. And to test whether you uh, do remember what transpiration is from yesterday, can you do one of the following in your books, please? Either define three keywords from yesterday's lesson on transpiration, or write down three key points from the last lesson in summary sentence form, so just some bullet points, or put in a paragraph uh, the learning of last lesson on transpiration. So if you could pause the video and do that now, please. Okay, so hopefully we had a go at that. You can look back in your notes now and let's see whether the information you put down was correct. So you can pause the video and just double check that what you've written is correct. So what do we need to know today? So for one to four, we need to be able to recognize factors that affect transpiration and simply describe how a potometer, uh, which is what we use to measure transpiration, can be used. For five to six, we need to explain why factors uh, affect transpiration, such as temperature, humidity, light, intensity, and airflow. So we need to say why uh, they increase it or decrease it. And we need to be able to describe about the bubble that moves in the potometer, which we'll look at. And um, for seven to eight, when we go over the uh, factors that affect transpiration, uh, you'll need to have a go at doing particle models to show that's happening, why that happens. Okay, so uh, uh, some of you might recognize this picture, but this is a picture of the Badlands, bad um, uh, which is a desert region in Australia. Now, in 2003, which was a record one, um, the Badlands actually got to temperatures of 69.3 degrees Celsius, so uh, ridiculously hot. What do you think the environmental conditions are? How do the plants living here survive these conditions? So just pause the video and have a think about those. You don't need to write any of them down. Okay, so uh, this will be obviously something that we're looking at in today's lesson, but uh, the environmental conditions are it's going to be very, very hot um, and it's also going to be quite dry. And how do you think they survive these conditions? You might have drawn on one of the previous lessons and spoke about the waxy cuticle of a leaf uh, being thicker um, to uh, prevent the water loss. If we look at the uh, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, and I am going to get most of these pronunciations wrong, I'm sure. Um, Ellesmere Island is part of the uh, ooh, something region in the Canadian territory of Nunavut, um, which is pretty much the most northerly part of Canada, so right at the top of the globe. What do you think the environmental conditions are here? And how do you think plants living here survive these conditions? So again, pause the video, have a little think. It'll be a good introduction to today's lesson. Okay, so you probably went for the opposite of the last one in the Badlands. Um, it's gonna be very, very cold. Um, there's probably gonna be ice uh, pretty much everywhere most of the year. And you might have seen in the picture, there aren't big trees or anything like that growing. Um, plants are actually tend to be quite small uh, so that they don't uh, die from the cold. <coughs> and in these kind of plants, there isn't going to be that waxy cuticle thickness uh, that you would find in the desert. So 
the effect of the environment. Now, different conditions will affect the rate of transpiration. So we're talking about how quickly that water is moving through the roots, through the xylem in the stem, to the leaves and evaporating out. And some environments are much more tricky for plants to survive in than others. So you can see we've got a picture of a desert and a rainforest, very, very different conditions. Uh, you can see there's a lot more uh, plants in the rainforest because the conditions are really, really good. Now, these are the four main factors that affect the rate of transpiration, and they are the temperature, the humidity, so that's talking about the moisture in the air, the air movement, so wind, and the light intensity. We need to know these four uh, factors that affect the rate of transpiration. So uh, can you pause the video now and write those down, please? Okay, so we said about the uh, light intensity being a factor, and that's because if there is more light intensity, or higher light intensity rather, um, it will increase the rate of photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, the plants are using water and carbon dioxide to make their food glucose and also producing oxygen as a waste product. So uh, if light intensity increases, there will be more photosynthesis. Now, as the rate of photosynthesis increases, so too will the rate of transpiration because they need more water for photosynthesis. Now, uh, because the uh, stomata are open as well to let in more carbon dioxide, that also means that there'll be more water that is lost through the stomata. So can we summarize these three bullet points, what I've just spoken about, into one sentence saying how the rate of photosynthesis or the light intensity uh, affects the rate of transpiration. So the higher the rate of photosynthesis, the higher the rate of transpiration, because the stomata are open to lay more carbon dioxide, which means more water is lost. So pause the video now. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, we're kind of putting in the next ones uh, in one lump, uh, because it's looking at the rate of evaporation. So when we're talking about the rate of transpiration, it's how quickly that water is moving, and that is pretty much uh, controlled by how much water is evaporating from the leaf. So if you increase the temperature, that means that the evaporation will be quicker because those particles in the liquid water will uh, gain enough energy quicker and turn into a gas. Now, if there is dry air around, so not humid, then it means that there is a bigger concentration gradient because there's less water in the air in the atmosphere compared to the water in the plant. So that means the water moves faster. And the last one about the uh, airflow, that's to do with the windy conditions. And if it is windier, then the rate of evaporation will also be faster. And that's because that those water molecules are being moved away. So it keeps that concentration gradient. So in summary from these points, the higher the temperature, the faster, the higher the rate of transpiration. The lower the humidity, the higher the rate of transpiration, and the higher the airflow, the higher the rate of transpiration. So can we pop those three down now, like we did with the light intensity and photosynthesis? So pause the video 
and just one sentence uh, for each of those explaining why they affect the rate of transpiration. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now is use those ideas. Um, we've got four different environments. We've got the Arctic tundra, uh, we've got a rainforest, we've got a desert, and we've got the windiest place on Earth. So for each environment, explain how the environmental conditions will affect the rate of transpiration. So you have to think about what the conditions are in relation to light intensity, humidity, temperature and airflow and say whether you think that the rate of transpiration will be greater or less in that area. So this will take uh, several minutes so you need to pause the video, pop down each environment and say what, how it's going to affect the rate of transpiration. Okay, so hopefully we've had a go at that. Hopefully we realise that in the Arctic tundra it's going to be very cold, so that will cause the rate of transpiration to be quite low. For those thinking outside the box, you might have also said that there'll be lower light intensity, so that also will uh, mean the transpiration is less. For the rainforest, probably per that because of the higher the temperatures and the more light intensity, the faster the rate of transpiration. But again, those thinking outside the box might also put in that it's going to be very humid there. It's going to be a lot of moisture. So that will actually lower the rate of transpiration. But overall, there will be a higher rate of transpiration compared to the Arctic tundra. The next environment is the desert. Um, the conditions there are going to be very low humidity, very high uh, temperatures and light intensity. Um, so that all of those three will greatly increase the rate of transpiration. So it'll be happening very, very quickly there. Um, for the windiest place on Earth, it doesn't give us much more detail than that. So we can only really talk about the airflow. Um, because it's going to be very windy, that's a lot of airflow, so that will increase the rate of transpiration. So hopefully we made some of those connections for each environment. Um, that is going to be important, and hopefully we're able to say why the rate of transpiration will be higher or lower. Now, uh, if we take the desert that we just spoke about, that's got a very, very high rate of transpiration, but in a desert, there's hardly any water. So uh, the plants that live in deserts have to be very specially adapted um, so that they're able to photosynthesize, but not lose water through the stomata. Now, one of the ways that they do that is that they've got that thick waxy cuticle, which we've already spoken about, but also the leaves will actually roll in on themselves. Now, the reason for that um, is that the stomata will all be pointing inwards uh, so that that will actually cause it to be quite humid inside the leaf because the uh, little water that does escape will stay inside the leaf and that will cause it to be quite humid. So the plant will end up losing less water through that, which is a fantastic adaptation, enabling them to grow in very, very hot uh, conditions. <clears throat> now, uh, by folding the leaves in, it also means that there's less direct sunlight. So it decreases the light intensity. Other adaptations that you might know of, succulents are very popular at the moment and they're able to store water, so that's really, really important. And also uh, quite a lot of them don't have leaves like you would find uh, in the English countryside, in trees in England, uh, because they would burn very, very quickly. 
Now, uh, something else that quite a lot of plants do, even in uh, England, is wilting. And you might have seen when it's uh, sort of midsummer and you haven't watered your plants, um, that they will actually wilt. And that is an adaptation. So uh, because the leaves wilt, it causes them to droop. And that means that there's less uh, surface for light to hit it. So it reduces the light intensity. Um, that will slow down photosynthesis. Uh, so that reduces the amount of water loss. So can we put down a few adaptations that plants have that reduce the amount of water loss? So we've looked at the waxy cuticle <coughs> uh, that reduces the amount of water that is lost from the leaves. We looked at the folding of the leaves because that will increase the humidity, and reduce the amount of light intensity. And also what is on this slide, uh, which is about the wilting of plants. So can we pop down uh, some of those adaptations that plants have? Pause the video now. Okay, now as scientists, we're able to measure the rate of transpiration. And the piece of equipment that we will use to do that is a photometer. So you can see a picture here of a photometer. I would suggest that you either, uh, if you have access to a printer, print out a picture of a photometer and add that to your notes. It comes up a lot in exams. Um, or you can just do a quick sketch of it, uh, keeping it very, very simple. But this is a photometer. So pause the video, give yourself some time to get that. Um, and then we'll talk about how it actually works. Okay, so hopefully we've got a picture on it. So as I'm talking about it, you might want to annotate your picture just to show how it actually works. Now a photometer, um, as you can see, will be used on plants. So you take your plant cutting and you put it into one end of the uh, piece of equipment. And you can see this actually using a bung uh, to make sure that there are very little, that no gaps left around the outside of the plant. Now you'll notice that there is something called a reservoir. Now the reservoir has got a uh, piece of equipment on it that controls the water uh, flow. So most of the time it'll be off and we open up the tap so that we can move the air bubble, uh, which you can see uh, labeled on the diagram. So we can move that air bubble back to the beginning again. We have a ruler or measuring device for distance attached to a capillary tube. And we also create a little air bubble. And that's really important because that's what we are tracking. That is what will move to allow us to see how much water has been taken in. And then you have just got a beaker of water to allow the water to go up through the capillary tube. And the capillary tube is just a very, very thin piece of tubing. If we use normal size tubing or thick tubing, uh, then it would be such a small movement, it wouldn't be give us uh, very accurate results. So we use capillary tubing so that the air bubble will move more. So what you do is you set up the equipment, you can record where the air bubble is, then uh, change a condition or put it into a certain condition. So it could be high temperature, high humidity, um, perhaps you're changing the light intensity on it or the wind flow over it. And for a set amount of time, you can let it do its thing, let transpiration happen. And then you can record where the air bubble ends up. And you would then use that to create a distance that the air bubble has moved, so the final distance minus the initial distance. And that will give you how far the bubble has moved. 
obviously the bigger the distance that the bubble moves, the more transpiration has happened. So you might want to pause the video if you haven't been doing it as I've been going through and just adding annotations on what the pieces of equipment do and how it works. Okay, so it looks like quite a few questions, uh, but this is just uh, using what we've done in a exam kind of question. Um, got some questions here, three questions with parts to them. I'll go through the questions and you can pause the video, have a go at those and then we'll go through the answers. So question number one, part A, name the parts of the leaf that help the plant to reduce water loss under normal conditions. So where is that water loss happening? What are the names of the actual parts of the leaf? What do we call them? <clears throat> For B, explain the effect of transpiration of a fan blowing onto the leaves of the plant. And that's going to be worth three marks. So you need to say what it will do to transpiration and why that will happen. For question number two, part A, describe the effect on plant transpiration of coating the top surface of the leaves in petroleum jelly. So that's Vaseline. So what would happen to the rate of transpiration if you put Vaseline on the top of a leaf? Part B says describe the effect on coating the bottom of the leaf in Vaseline. For C, explain the difference in the responses you have described for parts A and B. So for A and B, you just need to say whether it will increase or decrease transpiration. But for C, you need to say why uh, why there will be a difference, what causes that difference. And finally, question three, water lilies have their stomata on the tops of their leaves. A, suggests why this is an important adaptation for water lilies. And B, controlling transpiration is not very important to water lilies, suggest reasons for this. So uh, this uh, is the gonna be the last thing for this lesson. So I am expecting it to be taking a while to do these questions, to think about them, writing out your answers. So don't rush it. Um, this is the big chunk of the lesson. So uh, pause the video and have a go at answering those. Okay, so hopefully we've had a good stab at those. We will go through the answers, so grab a different coloured pen or pencil and let's see how we got on. So we're going to go through the answers. Uh, we're going to go through question one and two first. The next slide has question three on it. So question number one, part A, was name the plant, parts of the leaf that help the plant to reduce water loss. Um, that is to do with the waxy cuticle, so that waxy layer. Uh, on the top of the leaf and the guard cells for number two because they will be controlling how open or closed the stomata are. For B it said explain the effect of transpiration of a fan blowing onto the leaves of the plant. So uh, first off hopefully we said that the rate of transpiration would increase um, uh, and this is because the water for a separate point, and it hasn't got it on here, but on a separate point, because the uh, uh, water vapor is being taken away. Um, if you said that it will increase the rate of evaporation from the leaves, that will be a mark. And then if you said that that will uh, cause more water to be taken in or increase the water uptake, then that will be another mark. Question 2a was describe the effect of on a plant, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, transpiration of coating the top layer of the leaf. There are some stomata on there, but there's not that many. So the rate of transpiration will slightly reduce. If you said that it will uh, reduce, then that's fine. For B, 
who is asking the same question but talking about the underside of the leaf where most of the stomata are, uh, the rate of transpiration will reduce or will greatly reduce. The next question was explain the difference in the responses for part A and B. So if you said that there will be little effect on the top because there's less stomata, that will be worth a point. If you said that there's more stomata on the underside or the bottom of the leaf, then that will be a point. If you said that the uh, rate of evaporation from the cells uh, will be reduced, the surrounding area will become saturated or there'll be lots of water vapor in the air, would be worth the point. Okay, so hopefully we did well on those ones. Obviously, yet yeah, two uh, C and one B were the bigger answers, and hopefully we were able to pick up at least one mark in each of those. For question three, it was talking about water lilies, and part A was suggest why it's important that the stomata are on the top of the leaves, um, and the answer for that is if they were on the bottom, they would be in water. So that would be worth a point. Or you could have said that if they're on the top, they're not in the water. Either way. Um, and if they're on the top, it means that those gases can uh, escape or be exchanged for the second mark. And part B was controlling transpiration isn't very important in lilies. Why is that? You could talk about excess transpiration, not a risk. Uh, so basically they're in water, so they don't need to worry about how much water they're losing. Um, there's always, and for the second point, there's always going to be water uh, to take into the roots. So hopefully again, we're able to pick up some marks on that. Don't worry if you didn't get all of the marks for each question. It's about looking at the kind of thing that we need to be talking about to get full marks. And that is it for this lesson on looking at factors that affect the rate of transpiration. What we need to be able to do for one to four is just know those factors. So that is temperature, humidity, light intensity and airflow. For five to six, we need to say why that is. So for instance, if we increase the light intensity, there'll be more photosynthesis. So uh, there'll be more uh, water drawn up. And for seven to eight, hopefully we'll be able to, if asked in the exam, uh, be able to talk about the particle model uh, and why temperature, humidity, light intensity and airflow would have that effect on rate of transpiration. Okay, so for instance, spoke about with the temperature um, that the particles would gain more energy uh, quicker and therefore turn into a gas and evaporate faster. And also for all of them, we will need to know what a pitometer is and how we would use it to measure the rate of transpiration. So if you feel that you need to go back and take any further notes or any of those, please do. Otherwise, um, you'll hear from me tomorrow uh, for lesson three where we're actually going to be moving on to the next chapter where we're looking at diseases and pathogens which will obviously be quite apt for the times we are currently in. So have a lovely day and you'll hear from me tomorrow. Goodbye.